Okay, thank you very much for the, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's really great pleasure to be in this fantastic meeting. And also especially for me to be in Göttingen 30 years exactly after I started my postdoctoral um, period here. Um, we, uh, we come from developmental biology and being this uh, bioengineering uh, uh, meeting, we don't do bioengineering of tissues, but uh, we look at uh, cardiac development to try to understand how different lineages um, are specified and how they interact among them to form the developing heart. So I thought this was, uh, this was the, the topic that would be more interesting for you. And I will tell you about two different uh, stories if I have time. One about the early specification of the cardiac cell lineages in the mouse embryo. And the second one at mid-gestation, how the coronary uh, uh, lymphatic vasculature grows into the heart. So, let's see if it works. Yeah. so on the first topic, uh, as you probably know, um, mesodermal cells are, are produced in the primitive streak at the posterior uh, end of the, of the embryo and then migrate to the anterior part of the embryo where they very early form the cardiac crescent that contains already the main um, cell types, the cardiomyocytes and the endothelial cells that will become the endocardium. So the, the established view in the field is that there is a, a cell called cardiac progenitor cell that is specified and then subsequently Thank you. Okay. So I, I hope you heard what I said already uh, so far. So basically, you, you specify this uh, cell, cardiac progenitor cell, that then diversifies into cardiomyocytes and endocardium and forms the primitive heart tube. And later on, there are other progenitors that generate the second heart field and remain uh, uh, multipotent for, uh, for a while. Um, so we have been doing uh, clonal analysis in, in different projects in the lab. And some of the, of the results we obtained actually challenged that view. So we repeated a clonal analysis with a focus on this question, how the earliest cardiac progenitor cells are specified. And we did two approaches, one that we already published in several papers in which we used two independent reporters so that we can establish the clonality of the labels that we see. And we titrate uh, creactivation so that we get a very low induction rate and uh, reach clonality. Uh, this is retrospective, so you give tamoxifen and, and you guess the, the, the stage of the induction of the, of the clone, but you don't know exactly. And, uh, but we also wanted to do prospective analysis, and here, following the pioneering uh, work of Christy Lawson and Roger Pedersen, I think that we have seen very, very few uh, attempts to do prospective uh, clonal analysis. What we did is we used the same reporter system, but then we injected a uh, um, membrane permeable CRE at low doses. And we titrated the doses so that we could again achieve uh, clonal uh, frequency. So with this, we know exactly where we are injecting and also the timing of injection. So the results from these experiments is that actually, if you go early on, we see some clones where you have cardiomyocytes and endocardial cells. Those are assessed at 8.5 days of development when already the primitive heart is formed. Uh, but there are very few, actually, only a couple of them. Uh, this is the timing of induction. Uh, the majority of clones in which we find together cardiomyocytes and endothelial cells, they also contain other non-cardiac lineages that are here represented. Uh, and in parallel to this, we also get cardiomyocyte and other non-cardiac lineages together and endothelial or endocardial cells and non-cardiac lineages uh, together. So only very late, uh, well, not very late, but at day seven, so after gastrulation is uh, uh, started, uh, around mid-gastrulation, uh, we see the segregation and only clones that contain only cardiomyocyte and endocardial cells. So basically, very little evidence for a, a specific precursor for the cardiomyocyte and endocardial lineage. So we can look at this data with this uh, uh, jacquard similarity indexes that uh, tell you very intuitively what is the degree of relationship between the different lineages. And actually, between endocardium and cardiomyocytes, there is very little 
uh, correlation. This is what you find, but you find that there's much more correlation of cardiomyocytes with other embryonic mesoderm and of endocardium with other embryonic endothelium. So basically the conclusion from, from this part is that we think uh, the, the, the tree of a specification looks more like this. So basically there is a rapid um, transit from a multipotent uh, mesodermal precursor to a specification into cardiomyocytes or endothelial cells and endocardial cells are more related to other endothelial cells than to cardiomyocytes. And this fits well with uh, uh, early work that Elda Sahor did uh, in the chick and also suggested that uh, the things could, uh, could be this way. So for the second part of the talk, uh, uh, sorry, for the second part of this project, what we try to do is to look directly in vivo how this process happens. So we use live imaging, which uh, we established in the, in the lab a few years ago. And here what you're seeing is uh, NKX 2.5 reporting the cardiomyocytes and an notch reporter reporting the endothelium and endocardium, as you can see here. So this starts when already the cardiac crescent is formed and you see very nicely how this develops. So we wanted to uh, track the precursors from the primitive streak into the forming heart. And that's what we did in this kind of experiment. This is 27 hours of development. And here what we use is this trick. We induce a, uh, a random tomato that is transmitted by lineage. At this early stage, we don't see the uh, endothelial reporter, but at the later stage, you can start to see how the endothelial reporter comes on. And then we can backtrack the endothelial and the cardiomyocyte cells from the latest point to the earliest point. So using this procedure, we can also track uh, cell divisions as they move from the primitive streak to their definitive position. So that we can generate these trees and we know the timing of these divisions. As you can see here, cells divide more or less every eight hours. And this is a representation of these tracks for a particular embryo. And you can see that basically the endothelial and, 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 and so these are cardiomyocyte precursors, endothelial precursors, they divide and they colonize the cardiac crescent. They follow very similar tracks until they reach here. And uh, the surprising thing was that they were all coming from the same region of the primitive streak. So even though they are uh, specified here, um, they, they are intermingled in the primitive streak. Um, so the interesting thing is that this study fully uh, corroborated the clonal analysis. So all these uh, lineages, they give only endothelial cells plus perhaps other mesodermal, uh, also other mesodermal uh, lineages are all, only cardiomyocytes. But we never saw any of these cells generating both uh, cell types. So we wanted also to look at how and when the endothelial cells start to behave differently to cardiomyocytes. So we did these more detailed movies where uh, you can uh, track uh, the cells. So here, this is from the book of Margaret Kirby. You have, here, you have here the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. In this case, here is the ectoderm, the endoderm, and this is the mesoderm. At this stage, the, me the mesoderm is migrating still. So it didn't form the future pericardial cavity. It didn't epith epithelialize. If you look at the textbook knowledge, the proposal is that when these cells reach the cardiac crescent and epithelialize, then the endothelial cells delaminate. What we see is very different. What we see is that during the migration, these cells already have a different behavior. You can see this, this is a future endothelial cell. And what it does is uh, it separates from the other migrating cells, moves toward the endoderm, and from there on, it stays attached to the endoderm. And perhaps you can see there's a kind of passage that is open here for this cell uh, to go to the endoderm. So we think this is an interesting mechanism that we will study uh, further. So from this part, I told you that uh, cardiac progenitors are specified in the primitive streak directly from multipotent precursors. Cardiac precursors of the first field emerge from the same region of the primitive streak, and the field specific cell behaviors are detected before the formation of the splagnic uh, mesoderm. 
So if I, if I have time, I will tell you a little bit about the, what we learned about the picardial contributions to coronary lymphatic vasculature development. So it fits very well with the previous talk. So <clears throat> this is how lymphatics grow into the heart. You will hear more and, and better from Paul later about lymphatics. And uh, you know, there's a kind of independent colonization of the ventral and the dorsal part of the heart. Uh, apparently by angiogenesis from pre-existing vessels that colonize the pulmonary artery and the sinus venosus. Um, and then in a few days, this starts uh, at mid-gestation, so it's, it's, it's a little bit delayed with respect to uh, blood coronary vessels. And a few days uh, after, you can see that uh, they cover the, the surface of the ventricle. So um, the question is how these lymphatics grow into the heart? What are the signals that promote this growth? And why is it delayed? Uh, in other organs and other tissues, it's, it's been shown that the mural cells of arteries and veins can produce BGF, C, and D, and that um, drives the uh, growth of the lymphatics. If you look at the heart, these are the lymphatics, and these are the arteries, these are the lymphatics, and these are the veins. There's no correlation of the position of arteries and veins with the lymphatics. Actually, if you look in, uh, in a cross-section, what you find is that lymphatics grow very much attached to the epicardium. The veins are a little bit uh, inside with respect to lymphatics, and the coronary arteries are even farther below. So that suggests a role for the epicardium in the growth of the lymphatics. Actually, in previous work, what we found is that, uh, and other reports for also from, from Paul, show that uh, the epicardium does not contribute cells to the endothelial, endothelium of the lymphatics, but we found that it contributes um, epicardial-derived cells that associate very uh, closely with lymphatics. Also, in, this, uh, uh, in these studies, we also identified main transcription factors as potential very important regulators of the function of the epicardium related to uh, lymphangiogenesis. So what we did is we, we mutated the two main maze factors expressed in the epicardium, MIS-1 and MIS-2, with wt one cre What we found is that they don't form lymphatics as compared to the controls. Because wt one cre is expressed in other lineages than the, the epicardium, we also used a second uh, epicardial CRE line and we got the same result. So basically, maze regulates epicardial functions absolutely required for lymphatic growth. So we consider two hypotheses. One, that EPDCs, so cells derived from the epicardium, could act as a niche or scaffold because of this strong association for the lymphatics, or that the epicardium or EPDCs could uh, produce some paracrine signals involved in, in lymphatic growth. So uh, regarding the first uh, question, this is the strong association I referred to before. These are cells tracked from the epicardium and they uh, interact very tightly with uh, the, endothelium, the endothelium of the lymphatics. What you can see here is that they express um, fibroblast markers, but they don't express um, pericyte markers. So we don't think these cells are pericytes, we think they are fibroblast and perhaps a subtype of fibroblast. This is lineage tracing of the TCF21 lineage, which labels fibroblasts derived from the epicardium. And we can see that these cells associated with the lymphatics actually are from this lineage. And in the maze knockout, we see uh, down regulation of genes that are involved in the specification of fibroblasts. So we wanted to uh, make the direct question whether these fibroblasts would be important for uh, lymphatic growth. We knocked out uh, TCF21. And these are the controls. These are three different hearts. And these are three different mutant hearts. You can see that we go from, we have a variable phenotype from no lymphatics at all to very few and very thin lymphatics or some hearts that have a good number of endothelial cells, but the organization and maturation is much delayed, as you can see here. A number of markers of lymphatic endothelium are not expressed, like, for example, like one, very low expression, although PROX1 is very strong. So clearly, these uh, fibroblasts are important for the, uh, uh, the growth of the lymphatics in the heart, uh, but the phenotype we got is not the same as the complete uh, absence of lymphatics. So we also looked to the classical um, uh, signals that allow lymphatics to grow, 
and we identified BGFC and BGFD as term regulated in the, in the maze knockouts. Previous work has shown that, that epicardium actually is a preferential site of expression of BGFC in the heart. And we also characterize now BGFD, and we saw a very, very strong expression of BGFD in the epicardium. And this expression is, uh, is gone when we mutate maize genes. Also, the, these fibroblasts derived from the epicardial cells, they seem to express BGFD. So we, we overexpressed BGFC uh, from the epicardium, and what we obtained was a massive increase in lymphatic uh, vasculature in the heart. And we also knocked out the uh, BGFC, uh, sorry, the C is missing here, uh, from, the, from the epicardium again, again with WT1 Cre, and we saw a very strong reduction, not complete elimination, but very strong reduction of lymphangiogenesis in the heart. So confirming that uh, the second idea that uh, signals from the epicardium are essential for lymphangiogenesis is also true. So this is the, the model that uh, we are working with. Basically, um, we think the late invasion of the heart by lymphatics is because they need a full uh, uh, function from the epicardium, including EPDCs and signals. And, um, and we think uh, BGFC and perhaps BGFD are important for this, but also this interaction with this uh, uh, fibroblast in the heart. So this is the people that did the work. Uh, this is my whole group. And uh, Miquel Sendra here did the first part of the talk about the early precursors. And Esther de la Cruz was the main contributor to the, to the lymphatic story. And uh, Cristina Villa uh, is here in the audience. And she has a poster about um, another project of the lab in which uh, she's interrogating how make of expression can help the heart repair in different uh, conditions of heart injury. So thank you very much. <laughs>